I think we are ready to start. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to our next um, Beyond Autism Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Bernadette Rankas. I'm the head of early years at Beyond Autism. It's so great to see so many of you joining in. Um, please um, feel free to put your name and where you're listening in from in the chat function. Also in that function, we would really like to see your comments and questions. And at the end of this session, I will try to answer as many as possible. We will send you an email at the end of this webinar. Also in the email, you will find the recording. We record the whole session, so you will, you will be able to listen to it again. And um, we will send you a link um, that will take you to a page where you can give us feedback. Please help us improve our offering. If there is any topic or anything that you would like to hear about, let us know and our team will be working on it, making sure that we tailor our offer to your needs. These sessions are run free of charge. So if you would like to support the work that we do and help us create more content like this, please visit our website and make a donation. Um, this will all be in the email that you receive at the end of the session. Today I will be talking about the importance of early intervention and um, how building parental resilience together with early intervention will improve outcomes and this is going to be mostly based on the work that we do in early years and beyond autism and my experience in supporting parents um, in the past few years. So when we become parents, um, we think that we made that decision because we are ready. We might have, uh, you know, read all the books and watched webinars and watched videos and gathered all the research and information that we needed to make sure we're going to do the best um, way possible. And normally with the first child, we always stress a lot. And then when we have our second child, we might be a bit more relaxed thinking, oh, we are a bit more experienced now and we know what we're doing. But then um, the the bumps coming, the, the second child is developing differently or they don't sleep that well, they don't eat well. The point is that no matter what we do and how prepared we think we are, we always get caught off guard. Um, something can always happen and don't go on plan and we, we do stress um, a lot. What we all want for our child is to be happy and healthy and have a, a great independent life and develop meaningful relationships um, and uh, you know to communicate freely with others, to feel safe, to understand danger and then when they grow up to get a job and have their own family. So we plan, we plan um, the nursery, we plan that we're going to send our child to a great school and that will meet their needs and we're planning amazing birthday parties and uh, sleepovers and loads of, you know, making friendships with other families and spend time together. Um, so it's a little bit like a journey planner. We, we know our destination when our child is growing up and then we know that we choose the transport and, the, and that might be the milestones in the child's development. And then we have the routes, the stops. Um, it's the nursery, the school and the university. And the time, the, 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 the time of arrival is the, the adulthood. And that is the plan for everyone you know that's the that's the the ultimate goal when they become independent and they move out as my friend um said to me that's the best time when they move out and they come to visit you so happy and you so relieved when they leave uh, again but sometimes for some families the transport changes the the milestones are not uh, going quite as they were expecting um i'm sure you have sat on a bus um, before when suddenly before you get to your destination the driver said uh, the next bus stop is closed or the the bus is on diversion so if you're lucky you know before 
um, the bus stop is closed before you reach that bus stop and you have a chance to make changes. But sometimes, you know, the doors close, you have no chance to jump off. So you drive past that stop and then you end up somewhere else and then you have to make your way back um, and you need to figure out how to do it. And if you have loads of luggage with you, that is even more difficult. So when it happens for the first time, um, you might get frustrated and angry and don't really know what to do. But as you go throughout your journey, you might be prepared because you know you have a big luggage um, you need to find out, you know, where the, the bus stop that you need is going to be open or available or the provision that you need is going to be right. And then you make changes and you find out um, as much information as possible. So parenting is changing, is changing all of us. Um, the family is developing, we are learning new skills, we are learning to put someone else before everyone else, before ourselves as well. Um, and uh, it is a learning process in, in self-perception, in social context. Um, but when we have a child who is different um, and we realise that things are not going the way that we were expecting them to go. Um, that is an even bigger change and even more adaptation needed. Um, the, it's, you, you imagine you prepared all those wonderful birthday parties and take your child to nursery and then you suddenly see that your child is not ready for the nursery. When I meet with parents for the first time in early years, um, they often in a very um, difficult emotional states. They just find out that the child is not developing quite the way they were expecting that to develop and they really don't know what to do and it starts with not being able to understand them, not being able to communicate um, with them um, as you were planning to do. Um, it's, it's all different and it's all difficult. And that's the point when parents often start questioning their parenting skills. Am I a good enough parent? I can't meet my child's need. Um, they don't really know what to do. Um, and uh, they often expect this as trauma. Sometimes I meet with parents for the first time and they just say, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I was prepared for. Um, so they need help to reorient themselves, to, you know, to, to believe that they are good enough parents, to believe that they, they can do, you know, they know more than they think you, you do. So that's when the recalculating um, stage is coming. Um, and remember all those goals in the head um, to, have a, to have a child who is happy and healthy and uh, developing independence and making progress in all areas in their life. It's, it's all possible. Uh, it's, it's all happening. It's just happening in a slightly different way and in a slightly different pace, basically. Um, so um, because it's diverted, the journey is diverted and whatever works with other families or other children who are neurotypical, it will be different for autistic children. Um, and the parents first angry and then and first um, they they disappointed and they don't know what to do. But then then they learn, they learn to find out different ways. So many problems um, are out there that families are experiencing um, when they have um, an autistic child. They, they still experience stigma um, and because of that they're moving away from social life. I'm sure many of you have experienced when you go out and shopping or getting on public transport and your child displaying a behaviour that is challenging and you just get the look from, from the members of public. And it's really difficult, it's really frustrating. And because of that, so many parents just often just decide that they don't go out or they don't take their child with them. Um, there is also often a problem with lack of support network. Some families got um, parents, grandparents or other relatives helping but others don't have access to any sort of support. And sometimes there is also little understanding or a different perception from older family members. 
Um, and because of that, it's really important to support the whole family, not just the parents. So we always, at Beyond Autism Early Years, we always invite the parents and possibly both parents or they take turns by bringing the child. And we also invite grandparents or aunties uh, or whoever is living with the family um, or supporting the family. And there is also normally a change in friendship. Um, the friends, he, these parents had, you know, they, they have their children that are neurotypical and they do different things. And um, parents of autistic children often compare. They feel intimidated by situations when they share experience and they just simply withdraw. They just simply kind of stay away from these friendships and, and those, those events. So why is it important to, to build resilience? It is important um, because you have to take care of your child who, who, who finds difficult to communicate um, and uh, understand the world around them. And um, the first slide, the quote said that this is the ball that you cannot drop. Uh, you cannot change. You have to adapt and you have to be resilient um, and you have to keep going no matter what. And sometimes, not dropping the ball is very, very difficult. Um, you will need to communicate your child needs to others. You will need to understand, you know, where can you get from help, how professionals can help you. You, you often need to fight for the best support for your child um, and prepare them for adulthood and, uh, and being there for your immediate family as well, not just for your child. Having um, a child with different needs or additional needs, changing the dynamics of the whole family is difficult for parents, but it's also difficult for siblings. Um, we do um, focus a lot on sibling support um, and supporting extended family as I as I just said before. And, uh, you know, de developing resilience is just to keep your head above the water sometimes. Just be kind to yourself. Sometimes parents come to our session, um, to the parent discussion session, and they just say, I just, yesterday, I just didn't have a good day. I just couldn't follow up. I just gave in. And in you know it's okay it's okay not to not to always follow up not to always respond the way you expect it to do it's okay to be tired it's okay to you know sometimes some days is not going well and other days is going brilliantly but you are the one who knows the best your child and have the best intentions so just be kind to yourself um and then and then do your best um there are some main significant moments as um, the, the kind of realization is happening. So when first parents realize that there is a non-typical development, um, they always scared of the future um, and they really devastated by the communication and interruption failure and they and that they facing a different behavior and if they had if they have an older child it's even more obvious and they often compare um, and they that's the stage when they just realize that this is this is not something I used to this is not something I experienced before and I don't really know what to do and then changing their self-perception of parenting. That's when they start questioning, um, you know, their parenting abilities. Um, they have all the concerns and sometimes uh, there are some opinions from other people and it's really difficult to kind of keep your head, head above the water uh, with all the comments and all the good, you know, good advice coming from extended families, from grandparents, from other people. Um, so when they don't quite know what's going on and uh, there is no known reason for the change in the behavior or the, the delay in communication um, skills, that it is a daunting time. And then um, when they meet with reality is when there is a diagnosis. And in, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, the diagnosis comes early um, and that might be a shock and a relief at the same time. Um, more often, I think it's a relief because then suddenly everything's starting to make sense um, and they 
they kind of they know what's going on now and they know what direction they need to do or need to go although sometimes the diagnosis happens um you receive the diagnosis they say your child is on the autistic spectrum goodbye um, and good luck so there is very little support at this stage um, very little response from professionals um, very little involvement uh, very few families getting support from speech and language therapists or other services but normally there is in general it's quite insufficient resources um, and at that really vulnerable stage it would be really important to start intervention early. Then the family starts adapting to a new way of life. They accept that the child is different and they are learning, um, you know, that they have to care for them um, differently. And then they change the routine and they change their life. And it's not necessarily um, the, the best way in change of life that's then when they withdraw they try to avoid from situations of going out they change in their social life they adapt um, their everyday life to the needs of the child and um, when when we meet parents uh, they start their journey with us in early years and um, and we ask if there is any behaviors at home that is challenging or they find difficult to manage and and they often say no we we, we can manage and that's because they adapted their whole life to the needs of the child so if the child cannot really communicate their needs the parents are brilliant mind readers so they know you know from body language they know from the sounds they're making what they need and they just they just try to satisfy the needs straight away um, to make sure there is no conflict, there is no, you know, emotional stress and the child is just content and happy. But because of this way of operating as a family, uh, it sometimes is not really suitable to, to socialise or to, to have, you know, wide... Um, range of families as friends and uh, attend events together or go out on trips together. Um, basically, what parents is trying to do in this stage, they prevent situations that are embarrassing. So they don't get on public transport um, or they don't go shopping. They don't take their child shopping. Um, and then um, once they're living in the process, then they start mastering their skills. So they read about it and they learn about it. And in, in an ideal world, they will start getting support. Um, so they are redefining their parental role. They starting to believe that they are competent and confident. Um, there is a really lovely quote from, from one of the parents that we have been supporting in early years. And what she said is that it's just changed her perception. She she can now see differently. So there is there is much more than the difficulties. And uh, and um, after um, you know working with a group of professionals and and working on their resilience, and um, then they just feel they just feel different. They just learn to appreciate their child and and feel happy as parents and um, enjoy them. So when developing a new perspective of parenting, um, a new way of thinking, um, that ideally should happen with support. So what we do in early years, we help parents to understand the needs, first of all, understand their communication needs, understand sensory needs, social interaction, and um, their routine. And when parents start understanding it, it all comes together and it all makes sense. Also understand behavior as communication. When a child has um, language delay um, and they don't have any alternative method of communication, they simply communicate with behavior. And we sometimes misread behavior or miss you know, there is a misperception. It is communication. There is always a communication behind behavior. And if we understand it well, and if we respond accordingly, then we can teach appropriate ways of communication um, and alternative methods. Um, the other thing that we always say to parents um, is 
just focus on the things that your child can do. We really tempted to compare our children, compare to others in their class, compare to our friends' kids, compare to other children, the way they're playing in the playground. Um, every child is different and they all develop at a different pace. Um, a child is perfect as they are, they're developing differently and they might need different intervention. Um, and another big, big advice that we always um, try to give to parents is don't worry about what other people think. Um, I understand it's difficult when you get on the, on the bus and your child is having a difficult time and they might be screaming or crying. It's really not easy to get the, you know, to, to kind of deal with comments sometimes or, or deal with, you know, the looks. And because of that, sometimes parents rather give in and they let their child do things or get away with things that they wouldn't do at home. Um, it's it's important to stick to the strategies that you use at home um, stick to them in public um, that works for your and your child don't worry about who thinks what um, and just then go home um, and then be proud and feel good about how you you know treated your children the best way you think that is working for them so what we always say just trust yourself most parents or all parents know more than they think um, and when they're starting to realize that that's when real resilience is developing and and they they feel much better about themselves and they start to believe that yes they are they are um they are good parents and you know it's okay not to be perfect every day um, it's okay not to not to do well on some days or be tired uh, or just don't have the energy to to deal with certain situations. Um, I've done um, a research a couple of years ago for my studies um, where I was comparing mothers, groups of mothers caring for children with autism and another group um, caring for children um, with another neurodevelopmental disorder and caring for children, neurotypical children. I was comparing how, um, you know, how they felt about being, uh, being a, a carer and um, how satisfied they are. And uh, I was also looking at the prevalence of um, mental health issues. So whether they have anxiety or depression. Um, and I, for my surprise and the the participants' surprise as well, what the result turned out is that the lowest, um, basically the lowest level of anxiety and depression was detected uh, in mothers um, who cared for autistic children. And that is really interesting. And I think it's because, because Mums caring for children with additional needs learn to become super mums. They learn to, to develop resilience. They learn to, you know, keep going. Um, and they get that carer satisfaction um, that they're doing well and that and and it's a difficult situation, but their child is doing well. So they it turned out in that research that these mothers who was caring for autistic children were the most resilient mothers. Um, so what can professionals do to support families um, of autistic children? We, we need to recognize, identify barriers and intervene early, as early as possible. We need to tailor the intervention to the individual needs. Um, and whatever intervention we do, we need to make sure it's fun and motivating. The children learn through play um, and we can use any any opportunity, any life situation as a learning opportunity. Uh, we have to focus on all areas of development, so use the holistic approach. I don't personally don't believe that any isolated approach would work well. I think we need to look at a child as a whole and look at every areas. Um, it's also important to work with parents as a team. When a family starts in 
earlier, we always um, discuss what they would like to get out of these sessions, what they would like to get out of the support of the intervention. And we all we set targets together and we always look at what are the priorities at this stage of the family's life. And we always focus on those things and we support everyone. We support extended families and support siblings as well. Um, work together, work together with other professionals. And it's very important to, when we tailor the, the, the intervention to the needs of a child, we also tailor the intervention to the needs of a family um, and to all the cultural differences. So we make sure we use the approach what is best for that family at that time. So why, why should we intervene early? Um, it's basically, first of all, because you probably heard that um, the, the brain plasticity, it's basically, it basically means that we, we're not born with a brain ready and developed. When we're born, our brain is still developing, the networks are changing um, and uh, the circulations are reorganizing and these changes like, you know, new pathways creating um, and uh, these, when, when there is a neurodevelopmental disorder or autism, these pathways or the, basic, basically the, the the circles or the connections are developing differently. The brain might be over connected or or less connected, and that can, kind of brings the the symptoms and the difficulties, and that's what creates the barriers uh, in communication and in learning. But it's also, you know, with intervention, we can also change these circuits. We can also um, change the 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 pathways. So early intervention um, can change the path, the, the, the brain development. Um, so both it works, the intervention works, works the other way around. So it's not just the, the difference in brain development causing uh, the barriers, early intervention can make a changes in those um, developments. And it does, it does work um, both directions. The other, the other important thing is to develop social skills, which improves prospective memory. Prospective memory is when we remember to perform a task that we previously learned. Um, and um, very often it's important in really like dangerous situations. Um, prospective memory linked to social interaction um, so um, social skills and social interaction improves prospective memory. That's why this area is often um, affected um, in autistic children. And that is why early development of social skills um, and support developing their social skills is really important. When we say we identify barriers and support development, um, we always look at the behavior and what we teach parents is basically just to be a bit more conscious of what are we reinforcing or how we respond in different situations. A very, very simple example um, that I mentioned at the beginning maybe that, um, you know, mothers are brilliant mind readers. They know what their ch children want um, when they just whine a little bit or just, just seem unsettled um, or upset. They don't even say or communicate um, that what they need, but mum already knows. So they go and they say, oh, he wants juice. So mum goes and gets juice. This kind of proactive support or trying to make their children satisfied, if that happens, the child doesn't need to request, they don't need to communicate because they get what, what they want. So basically what we often work on with parents is just hold on to it. We know you know what your child wants. Let's teach him to request in any way, whatever is appropriate for them. If they have language, then verbally. If they don't, then we give alternative communication tools, but encourage them to request. Um, 
and that makes already a big difference in many cases. Um, children have difficulty with concentration, so we do focus a lot on developing attention span and processing information. Um, we always focus a lot on language and motor skills and uh, and social inter social social interaction um so um the lack of social motivation um, as i said has an impact on on prospective memory so we the, a big part of the work that we do is is about social interaction taking turns waiting for their turn whatever when we set targets for children we always look at whatever stage they are on their development and we start working from there we don't tailor our intervention to their age we tailor the intervention to the level of their development so this is basically this essence of the work that we do um, with with families um, early intervention is a big part as i said developing social skills communication supporting behavior positively very very often we focus on on eating very often we we need to work on personal um like self-help skills or um just um, basic requesting skills. And uh, the, other, the other big part is empowering parents. Um, and this is basically they learning about different techniques, but also in the session, we give parents the opportunity to take part in a parent discussion group every session. And that is a peer group that is a really important uh, peer group for them. As I mentioned at the beginning, so many of these families are very isolated at that stage of their life. And um, when they attend our sessions that, that or any, any, any parent group, that group might be the only opportunity for them to sit down with a group of grown-ups and have an adult conversation or have a cup of tea and share experiences. Everyone is at different stage of their journey in that kind of parenting, adapting to the to the to the to the fact that their child is different. Um, and some families are already over, you know, the first shock or trauma, and the other family is just in that stage. And parents give the best support to each other we can support them to a certain extent but when they share their own experiences and they hear from each other and how they you know got over certain situations and solve different problems and how they dealt with extending families or how they you know supported grandparents and helped them understand the child better or or some in some some families just simply accepting the fact that the child is autistic and and move on and start enjoying them the way they are they these families the shared experiences i think give a really big kick and a big support to to everyone and if early intervention happens um accordingly and the and the the communication skills improve you know the behavior is improving and the child is safe and the parents feel safe to take their child out because they believe in their own abilities and their own strengths um that's when the the quality of life of the whole family is becoming better um is changing sometimes we we have families when we arrange trips for example we have families who never took their child out in the community or they never um, never gone to the zoo or they be, just simply because they don't feel comfortable traveling on public transport these trips for example are very important because there is a team supporting them. So we teach the parents how to prepare the child for the trip. Then we go on a trip together. We support them throughout all the, the journey and the time there. We together plan um, a structure for the trip. 
uh, so parents learn all these skills. Um, we, we do write the social stories together and then parents learn how to use them. And we make that trip really successful and really enjoyable. And if it's a, if it's a success, if it's a, if it's a great and positive experience for the parent and the child, then the parent feel more empowered and they start doing it on their own because now they know you know how to prepare and how to support and they also know that it's okay if it's not going you know to plan it's okay if if there is a bump um if there is a there is a situation in the zoo that upsets a child and it's okay if there is a behavior that is challenging they know how to deal with it and they know how to move on and then once that period is over then they can carry on their trip and they really don't you know, pay attention to the members of public because that's not the important thing. The important thing is that they support their child the way is best for them um, and enjoy time together. Um, we often say to parents that, and, and I think we all do that, we, we always, you know, plan amazing things and we, in our head, we have, we have that kind of picture what we want our child to be, whether neurotypical or autistic. Um, we always worry about what they're going to become or what is going to happen when they grow up. Um, and in that process and in that worry um, and in that busy kind of thinking and preparing and getting ready for what is going to be in 18, 20 years time, we very often just forget that we have a child here who's adorable, who can do things, who is learning new skills every day. Um, and we all often just forget to enjoy. Uh, uh, we always, you know, recommend to parents to use, you know, we, in early years we have, we have an achievement tree and every parent can have an achievement tree. It's simply putting in writing tiny little things, tiny little successes that you and your child are having every day. Just create a child and just stick on it, you know, just to remind you every day that there is, there is a small victory every day. There is something good happens every day. And, um, and if you if you end up in a day when you know your laundry is creeping out of the laundry basket, just don't worry about it. If you if your child is having a good time, and you just catch that moment to to engage them in motivating activities, um, just do that. Um, you know we we don't need to be perfect every day. Um, also a good thing when if you feel uncomfortable taking your child out to to the community or worry about. Um, the the comments of the member of public or you know how or their perception we we often use and we take children out we often use these little cards um that helps them the the people on public transport understand and it just simply says this child um is autistic and they're having a difficult time um so just we're just trying to support them the best way possible. And um, there is no need to explain, there is no need to get engaged in conversation. Um, and hopefully then they will just realize if you if you have that little card, they hopefully just realize that you don't really need advice, you know what you're doing. And that is the basically the, the end of um, of the presentation. I hope um, you enjoyed it and I will try to answer the question that came across. Um, we have our next session uh, on Wednesday the 16th of March and that will be about managing change. Uh, transitions began small. I'm sure many of you will be interested to hear about it and that will be delivered by Matt Wicks who is our outreach consultant and I would also like to let you know that we have our professional conference coming up in May um, and this is the second year we, we, we host um, a professional conference. So you can click the link in the banner to find out more about the event. And just look out for the email from us. Um, please give feedback and get back to the recording if you'd like to. Thank you so much for listening. Um, let me have a look at the questions. So we have... Um, We have a few.
Okay, so one is um, from your experience and the work you do in your service, what do you think is the one thing that makes the biggest difference to parents? <sighs> uh, I think it's their confidence. I think the, the biggest difference is what we do, obviously developing communication skills with the child, but also I think that that they develop confidence in themselves. The, the parent discussion sessions are great. And, and I think what makes the biggest difference also is that our environment, our sessions are safe. It's a safe environment. It's a safe space to make mistakes. It's a safe space to ask questions. There are no silly questions. It's a safe space to say, I can't do this. I find it difficult. Um, you know, it's a safe space to be weak um, and to get it wrong and to to learn. Um, and you will always, you know, always get support from the team, from the other parents. And there is something really positive, something really amazing happens in every session. Um, it is a space where you don't need to feel bad if your child is having a meltdown. It, we all work together as a team, um, making sure we give the best support. Um, there is one more question and I need to finish in a minute. Um, just um, one more question I answer. What is the waiting list for getting an appointment with you Beyond Autism Early Years? We, we do have quite a long waiting list um, and it, most recently it's just gone up. We have about 30 families on our waiting list right now. Um, the waiting time is about two terms, I would say. Um, we try to get families on board as soon as possible. Um, and it also, also depends on the time of the year. The summer term is normally more busy. Um, and after the summer holiday, it's a bit more quiet. Um, when families start with us, we always say they sign up for two terms initially, and then we, we of course evaluate and see if they need more support, but a, approximately two school terms um, is the kind of time frame when we feel the, the families are ready to exit. Uh, they The parents never feel they ready to exit um, because the child always needs support, but we our focus is on you know how the parents develop resilience and their skills and understanding and confidence and that's when they're ready and we never just say goodbye to people we always stay in touch and parents can you know return back to us with questions but uh, i would say the waiting time is approximately two terms about about four months maybe um so thank you so much for listening um and I hope you, you enjoy the presentation and I hope many of you will be listening to Matt uh, on the 16th of March. Goodbye, everyone.